Chapter 10. The Children. All she did was run her fingers round Dyomka's tumor and hug his shoulders slightly. She then moved on. But something fateful happened as she did it, Dyomka felt. The twigs of his hope were snapped short. He didn't feel it all at once. First, there was a lot of talk in the ward, and everyone was saying goodbye to Proshka. Then he started scheming about how he could move into Proshka's bed by the window, now a lucky one. The light was better there for reading. It was also nearer for talking to Kostoglatov. And then a new boy came in. I feel obligated to, like, share exactly what happened last chapter. So basically, we're just coming off of there's one guy who's getting out of the hospital, but it's only because he's pretty much fucked. Basically, it's a death sentence, but he doesn't know that, and they didn't want to tell him, and they gave him a couple certificates of, I can't work because I'm so fucked up. Uh, and then he's like, yeah, see you guys later, and then he bounces. And now they're, like, talking about who's going to get his bed. Uh, but anyway, back to the story. And then a new boy came in. He was a young man, well tanned, with slightly wavy, tidy, pitch black hair, probably over 20 years old. He was lugging three books under his left arm and under his right three more. Hello, everyone, he announced from the doorway. Dyomka took a liking to him. He looked so unassuming and sincere. Where do I go? he said, gazing around, for some reason, not at the beds, but at the walls. "'Will you be reading a lot?' asked Dyomka. "'All the time!' Dyomka thought for a moment. "'Is it for your work, or just reading?' "'For my work.' "'Well, take that bed over there by the window, all right? "'They'll make it up for you in a minute. "'What are your books about?' "'Geology, pal,' answered the newcomer." Damka read one of the titles, Geochemical Exploration of Mineral Deposits. Take the bed by the window, then. What's wrong with you? My leg. With me, it's my leg, too. Yes, the newcomer was moving one leg a bit cautiously, but his figure, it was neat as an ice skater's. They made up the bed for him, and... As if it was the only reason he had come into the hospital, he laid five of his books out on the window sill and stuck his nose into the sixth. He read for an hour or so without asking a question or telling anyone anything. Then he was summoned to see the doctors. Dyamka, too tired to read. First, it was stereometry. He tried to build some models out of pencils, but the theorems wouldn't go into his head, and the diagrams, with their lopped-off straight lines and planes with jagged edges, kept on reminding him, hinting at the same thing. He changed to a book which was a bit easier. The Water of Life, by someone called Kozevnikov, which had already picked up the Stalin Prize. It was by A. Kozevnikov, but there were also an S. Kozevnikov and a V. Kozevnikov. Dyamka was rather frightened at the thought of how many writers there were. In the last century, there had been about ten, all of them great. In this century, there were thousands. You only had to change a letter in one of their names, and you had a new writer. There was Safronov, and there was Safonov, more than one Safonov, apparently. And was there only one Safonov? No. No one could have time to read all their books, and when you did read one, it was as if it might just as well not have been done. Completely unknown writers floated to the surface, won Stalin prizes, then sank back down forever. Nearly every book of any size got a prize the year after it appeared. Forty or fifty prizes popped up every year. Their titles, too, kept getting mixed up in Dyomka's head. A lot had been written about two films, The Big Life and The Big Family. One a very healthy influence, the other a very harmful one. 
but Dayomka simply couldn't remember which was which, especially as he hadn't seen either. It was the same with ideas. The more he read about them, the more confused they seemed. He had only just grasped that to analyze objectively meant to see things as they are in life. But then he read how Panova, a woman novelist, was being attacked for treading the marshy ground of objectivism. Nevertheless, he had to cope with it all, understand and remember it. When Tayomka read The Water of Life, he couldn't make out whether the book was a drag or whether it was the mood he was in. Exhaustion and gloom pressed on him more and more heavily. Did he want someone to talk it over with? Or someone to complain about to? Or just someone to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with, who might perhaps even show him a little pity? Of course, he had read and heard that pity is a humiliating feeling, whether you pity or are pitied. Even so, he wanted someone to pity him. Because throughout his life, no one had ever pitied Dayomka. Here in the ward, it was interesting listening and talking to people, but he couldn't talk to them in the way he'd now wanted. When you're with men, you have to behave like a man. There were women in the clinic, a lot of them, but Dayomka could not make up his mind to cross the threshold of their large, nosy ward. If they had all been healthy women there, it would have been fun to glance in on the way past on the chance of seeing something interesting. But confronted by the great nest of sick women, he preferred to turn away from whatever he might see there. Their illness was like a screen of prohibition, much stronger than mere shame. Some of the women he met on the stairs or in the hallways were so depressed, so low-spirited, that they hardly bothered to pull their dressing gowns round them, and he could not avoid seeing their nightdresses round their breasts or below their waists. When this happened, though, he felt no joy, only pain. This was why he always lowered his eyes when he saw them. It was no easy matter to make friends here. Aunt Steolfa noticed him. She began to ask questions, and they became friendly. She was a mother and a grandmother already, and had, like all grandmothers, wrinkles and an indulgent smile for human weakness. He and Aunt Steolfa used to stand about near the top of the stairs and talk for hours. No one had ever listened to Dionka so attentively and with such sympathy. It was as though she had no one nearer to her than he. And for him, it was easy to tell her things about himself and even about his mother, which he would have never revealed to anyone else. Dionka was two years old when his father was killed in the war. Then he had a stepfather, not affectionate, but just, and quite possible to live with. His mother became, he had never spoken the word in front of Stiofa, although he himself had long been certain of it, a whore. His stepfather left her, quite rightly. After that, his mother used to bring men to their one room. They always used to drink, and they tried to make Dionka drink too, but he wouldn't take it. And then the men stayed with her, some till midnight, others till morning. There was no partition in the room and no darkness because light came in from the street lamps, and it sickened Dionka so much that the very thought of it, which his friends found so thrilling, seemed to him like so much pig swill. And so it went on during the fifth and sixth classes when he had reached the seventh class, however, Dayomka went to live with the school watchman, an old man, and the school gave him two meals a day. His mother didn't even try to get him back. She was glad to wash her hands of him. Dayomka spoke angrily about his mother. He couldn't speak calmly. Aunt Stiofa listened to him, shook her head, and said strangely, when she'd heard him out, "'It takes all sorts to make a world.' We are all in this world together. Last year, Dayomka had moved into a factory housing estate. There was a night school there, and they gave him a place in a hostel. 
He worked as a lathe operator's apprentice, and later they made him a second-grade operator. He wasn't very good at the job, but as he wanted to be different from his devil-may-care mother, he didn't drink or yell rowdy songs. Instead, he studied. He did well in eighth class and finished the first half of ninth. Beside that, there was only football. Sometimes he used to run about playing football with the boys, and fate punished him for this, the one little pleasure he enjoyed. In a scramble for the ball, someone accidentally hacked him on the shin with his boot. Dayomka didn't even think about it at the time. He limped for a bit, and then the pain was gone. But in autumn, his leg started to ache more and more. It was a long time before he went to the doctor with it. They gave him warm compresses for it, but it got worse. They sent him along to the usual medical obstacle course, first to the provincial center, and now here. Why is it, Dayomka would ask Aunt Stayofa, that there's such rank injustice in fortune itself? There are people whose lives run smooth as silk from the beginning to the end, and I know there are, while others are a complete louse-up, and they say a man's life depends on himself. It doesn't depend on him a bit. It depends on God, said Aunt Stiofa soothingly. God sees everything. You should submit to him, Dayomusha. Well, if it's from God, it's even worse. If he can see everything, why does he load it all on one person? I think he ought to try and spread it out a bit. But there was no two ways about it. He had to submit. What else was there for him to do? Aunt Stiofa lived locally. Her daughters, sons, and daughters-in-law often used to come and visit her and bring her things to eat. She didn't keep them for long. She shared them with her neighbors and the orderlies. She would call Dayomka out of his ward and slip an egg or a pastry into his hand. Dayomka's appetite was never satisfied. All his life he had never had enough to eat. His constant anxious thoughts of food had made his hunger seem greater than it really was. Still, he felt embarrassed at taking so much from Aunt Stiofa. If he accepted the egg, he would try to refuse the pastry. Take it, take it, she would say waving it at him. It's got meat in it. You can eat it now. Well, it's still meat week. Why can't I eat it afterwards? Of course you can't. Don't you know that? So what comes after meat week? Shrovetide, of course. That's even better, Aunt Stiofa. Shrovetide's even better. Better in some ways, worse in others, but no meat. Well, Shrovetide doesn't end then, does it? What do you mean, doesn't end? It's gone in a week. So what do we do next? Asked Dayomka cheerfully as he gobbled up the fragrant homemade meat pie, the like of which he'd never been baked in his home. Good heavens, doesn't anybody grow up Christian these days? No one knows anything. After that comes the Great Fast. But what's that for, the Great Fast? Why a fast, and why a great fast? Because, Dayamusha, if you stuff your belly full, it will pull you right down to the ground. You can't go on stuffing like that. You have to have a break sometimes. What's a break for? Dayamka couldn't understand. He'd never known anything else but breaks. Breaks are to clear your head. You feel fresher on an empty stomach, haven't you noticed? No, and Stayofa, I haven't. Ever since he had been in the first class, before he could read or write, Dayomka had been taught, knew for certain and fully understood that religion is a drug, a three-time reactionary dogma of benefit only to swindlers. Because of it, the working people in some places had been unable to free themselves from exploitation, but as soon as they got rid of religion, they would take up arms and free themselves, and Aunt Siofa with her funny calendar, with the word God always on her lips, with her carefree smile even in that gloomy clinic, and her pastry was obviously a thoroughly reactionary figure. 
Nevertheless, on Saturday after lunch, when the doctors had gone and each patient was left alone with his thoughts, when the cloudy day still lent a little touch of light to the wards, while on the landings and in the corridors the lamps were already on, Dayomka would walk about, limping and searching everywhere for none other than the reactionary, Aunt Stiofa, who could give him no sensible advice except to submit. He was afraid they'd take it away, amputate it. He'd have to give it up. To give it up, not to give it up. To give it up, not to give it up. With the gnawing pain he felt, perhaps, to give it up would be easier. But Aunt Stiofa was in none of her usual places, so he went downstairs to the lower corridor, where it broadened out into the little lobby that was regarded as the clinic's red corner. Asterisk next to red corner. Most Soviet institutions possess a red corner, which is a room with magazines and communist literature. The main floor duty nurse's table stood there with her medicine covered. And then he saw a girl, almost a child, wearing the same kind of faded gray dressing gown. But she was like a film star, yellow hair, the sort you'd never saw anywhere, with something light and rustling built up from it. Dayomka had glimpsed her for the first time the day before, and her hair, yellow like a bed of flowers, had made him blink. She seemed so beautiful, and that he had not dared to let his eyes rest on her. He had turned them away and walked past. Although there was no one closer to him in age in the whole clinic, except for Surhan, the boy whose leg had been amputated, he knew that girls like that were beyond his reach. This morning, he caught sight of her again from behind. Even in her hospital dressing gown, she had a waist like a wasp. You could recognize her at once. And her little sheaf of yellow hair quivered. Dayomka had certainly not been looking for her. He knew he'd never be able to make up his mind to approach her. He knew that his mouth would stick like paste and he'd bellow something unintelligible and stupid. But he saw her and his heart missed a beat. Trying not to limp, trying to walk as evenly as possible, he made his way to the red corner where he began to flip through a pile of local pravda already thinned out by patients for packing and other uses. Half the table, which was covered by a red cloth, was taken up by a bronze bust of Stalin with larger-than-life sized head and shoulders. Opposite, at the corner of the table, stood an orderly, also heavily built, with a large mouth. She seemed to make a pair with Stalin. It was Saturday, and she did not expect any rush, so she had spread a newspaper on the table in front of her and poured some sunflower seeds onto it. She was shelling them with relish, spitting out the husks onto the newspaper without any help from her hands. She'd probably only come in for a minute, but been unable to tear herself away from the sunflower seeds. A loudspeaker on the wall was hoarsely blaring dance music. At a small table, two patients were sitting playing checkers. The girl Dayomka was watching out of the corner of his eye was sitting on a chair by the wall, doing nothing, just sitting straight-backed, holding together the neck of her dressing gown. They never had any hooks unless the women sewed them on themselves. She sat there, a delicate yellow-haired angel, untouchable, who looked as though she might melt and vanish. But how good it would be to talk to her about something, even about his bad leg. Dayomka was angry with himself. He kept turning the pages of the newspaper. He suddenly realized that when he had had his hair cut, he had not asked them to leave the curl on his forehead, not wanting to waste time. He'd let them clip his head all over with the clippers. Now she must think he looked like an idiot. Then suddenly the angel spoke. Why are you so shy? This is the second day you've been around. You haven't come up to me. Dayomka jumped. He looked around. Well, 
Who else could she be talking to? Yes, she must be. She was talking to him. The tuft of plume on her head trembled like spikes of a flower. What's the matter? Are you the scared type? Go on, get a chair, pull it up. Let's get to know each other. I'm not scared. But something broke in his voice and stopped it, ringing out in the normal way. Then get a chair. Park it next to me. Dayamka took the chair, making an extra effort not to limp. He carried it with one hand and put it next to her by the wall. He gave her his hand. Dayomka. Asia. She put her soft palm into his hand and drew it away. He sat down, and it struck him as funny. There they were, sitting next to each other like bride and groom. He couldn't even see her properly. He got up and moved the chair into an easier position. Why do you sit here, not doing anything? Dayomka asked. Why should I do anything? Anyway, I am doing something. What are you doing? I'm listening to music. I'm dancing in the mind. Can't you? In the mind? All right, then, on the feet. Dayomka sucked his teeth, which meant no. I saw you were rather green. We could have a turn round the floor now. Asya looked around. Only there's nowhere to do it, and what kind of dance is this anyway? So I just listen. Silence always gets me down. Which is a good dance. Dayomka was enjoying this conversation. The tango? Asya sighed. The tango? That's what our grandmothers used to dance. The thing today is rock and roll. We don't dance it here yet, but in Moscow they do. Only professionals, of course. Dayomka did not really take in all she was saying. It was nice just to talk to her and to be allowed to look straight at her. She had strange eyes with a touch of green. But you can't paint eyes. They stay the way they are. Even so, they were pretty. That really is a dance. Asiya clicked her fingers. Only, I can't give you a demonstration. I've never seen it. How do you spend your time, then? Do you sing songs? No, I can't sing. Why not? We always sing when silence gets us down. So what do you do? Do you play the accordion? No, said Dayomka, covered with shame. He wasn't much compared to her. Was he? He couldn't just blurt out to her that his passion was for social problems. Asiya was quite at a loss. What a funny type, she thought. Are you an athlete, then? I'm not bad at the pentathlon myself, by the way. I can do 140 centimeters, and I can do 13.2 seconds. No, I'm not. Dayomka realized bitterly how worthless he must seem to her. Some people couldn't fix up their lives so easily. Dayonka would never be able to. He played a little football. And where had it got him? You do at least smoke and drink, Asiya asked, still hoping, or is it only beer? Beer, sighed Dayonka. He had never tasted beer in his life, but he couldn't let himself be completely disgraced. Oh, groaned Asiya, as though someone had knocked all the breath out of her. What a lot of mama's boys you all are. No sporting spirit. The people at school are like you. Last September, they moved us to the boys' school. Asterisk next to school. In September 1954, co-education was reintroduced in Russia. Okay, so that's the, the reintroduction of co-education in Russia. But the headmaster kept on just a few teachers, pets, and bookworms and miserable types. All the best boys he stuck in the girls' school. She did not mean to humiliate him. In fact, she was sorry for him. But all the same, he was hurt that she should think him a miserable type. Which class are you in? He asked. The tenth. So who lets you wear your hair like that? Who lets us? They fight us, and we fight them. It was open-hearted, the way she spoke. But let her tease him. Let her even pummel him, the only thing that mattered was that they were talking. The dance music stopped, and the announcer began to speak of the people's struggle 
against the shameful Paris treaties, which were dangerous for France because they put her at the mercy of Germany, and intolerable for Germany because they had put her at the mercy of France. So what do you do? Asia was still trying to find out. I'm a Turner, Dionka said casually, but with dignity. Even the Turner did not impress Asia. How much do you earn? Dionka was very proud of his pay, for it was his own and the first he had ever earned. But now he felt he couldn't let on how much. Oh, it's nothing, nothing at all, he forced himself to say. It's a complete waste of time, declared Asia, quite categorically. You'd do much better to become a sportsman. You've got what it takes. But you have to know how. What do you have to know? Anyone can be a sportsman. You've only got to train a lot. And it pays. You travel for nothing. You get 30 rubles a day for food and free hotels and bonuses thrown in. And think of the places you see. Where have you been? I've been to Leningrad, Verones. Did you like Leningrad? You bet. The shops in the Passage and the Gostiny Dvor, they've got separate stores for everything. Stores for stockings, stores for handbags. Dayanka could not imagine such things, and he envied her. Perhaps it was true. Perhaps the things this little girl was talking about so freely were the good things of life, and everything he depended on was musty and provincial. The orderly was still standing by the table like a statue, spitting out husks without so much as bending her head. You are a sportswoman, but you are here. He would not have dared to ask what part of her body actually hurt. The question might have been embarrassing. I'm only here for three days, examination. Asiya waved her hand. The collar of her dressing gown kept falling open, and she had to keep holding it together or adjusting it with one hand. This stupid dressing gown they make you wear here, I'm ashamed to put it on. A week here is enough to make you go crazy. And what have they picked you up for? Me. Dionka sucked his teeth. He wanted to tell her about his leg, but he wanted to do it sensibly. Her lightning attack threw him off balance. It's my leg. Up to then, the words, it's my leg, had been full of deep and bitter meaning for him. But faced with Asya's lightness of heart, he was beginning to doubt whether it was really so grave. He spoke of his leg almost as he had of his pay, with embarrassment. What do they say about it? Well, they don't really say anything, but they want to, to cut it off. His face darkened as he said these words and he looked at Asiya's bright face. Nonsense! Asiya slapped him on the back like an old friend. Cut off your leg? They must be crazy! It's just that they don't want to treat it. Don't let them do it. It's better to die than to live without a leg. What sort of life is it for a cripple, do you think? Life is for happiness. Yes, of course. She was right again. What kind of life was it on crutches? He would be sitting next to her now. But where would he put the crutches? Where would he put the stump? He wouldn't even be able to bring up a chair by himself. She'd have to bring one for him. No, without legs it wouldn't be any sort of life. Life was for happiness. Have you been here long? How long? Dayomka thought to himself. Three weeks. How awful! Asya shook her shoulders. How boring! No radio, no accordion. And I can imagine the sort of talk there is in the ward. Again, Dionka did not want to admit he'd spent whole days reading books and studying. All his values were tottering under the breeze of Asya's words. They seemed exaggerated, cardboard even. He grinned, although inside he was not grinning at all, and went on, Well, for instance, we were discussing what men live by. What do you mean? Well, why they live, that sort of thing. Pah! Asya had an answer for everything. We had an essay about that at school. What does man live for? They gave us study material full of cotton growers, milkmaids, Civil War heroes. What is your attitude to the brave 
deed of Pavel Korshagin? What is your attitude to the heroism of Matrasov? What is your attitude? Well, what? Should we do what they did? The teachers... Oh, there was an asterisk by ne next to Matrasov. Korshagin is a character from Nikolai Ostrovsky's How the Steel Was Tempered. Matrosov was a hero of World War II who threw himself on a German machine gun covering it with his body. Okay. What is your attitude? Well, what? Should we do what they did? The teachers said we should. So we all wrote that we would. Why spoil things just before the exams? But Sashka Gromov said, Do I have to write all that stuff? Can't I write what I really think? Our teacher said, I'll give you what you really think. You'll get the worst marks you've ever known. And one girl wrote, you should have been there. I don't know yet whether I love my country or not. Our teacher quacked like a duck. What a lousy idea. How dare you not love your country? Perhaps I do love it, but I don't know. I must find out for myself. What is there to find out? You ought to drink in love for your country with your mother's milk. Write it all out again by the next lesson. We call her Toad. She comes to class and never smiles. Everyone knows why. She's an old maid. She hasn't made much of her private life, so she takes it out on us. Most of all, she hates the pretty girls. Asia was throwing the words out casually. She reckoned she knew all right what a pretty face was worth. It was obvious she hadn't been through the disease at all. The pain, the suffering the loss of appetite and sleep, she hadn't yet lost her freshness or the color in her cheeks. She just popped in from one of her gyms or dance floors for a three-day examination. But there are some good teachers, aren't there? Dayomka asked, only because he did not want her to fall silent, because he wanted her to keep talking while he sat and looked at her. No, not one. They're all a lot of puffed-up turkeys. Anyway, school. Who wants to talk about school? Her cheerful healthiness broke over Dayomka. He sat there grateful to her for chattering, no longer inhibited, relaxed. He did not want to argue with her. He wanted to agree with everything she said in spite of his own beliefs. He'd have felt easier and more at peace with his leg, too, if it had stopped gnawing at him and reminding him he had done it, an injury, and that it was about to get its own back on him. Would it be halfway up the shin, or up to the knee, or half the thigh? Because of his leg, the question, what do men live by, remained one of the most important things in his life. So he asked her, no, but seriously, what do you think? What do people live for? Oh yes, this little girl understood a thing or two. She turned her greenish eyes toward Dayonka, as if not quite sure whether he was playing a joke on her or being serious. What for? What do you mean? For love, of course. For love? Tolstoy had said, for love, too. But in what sense? And the girl's teacher had made them write for love, too. But in what sense? After all, Dayonko is used to having things precise in his mind, to working them out for himself. But he began hoarsely. It was simple enough, perhaps, but rather embarrassing to say. After all, love isn't the whole of your life. It only happens sometimes, from a certain age and up to a certain age. From what age? Asya interrogated him angrily, as though he had offended her. It's best at our age. What else? What is there in life except love? Sitting there with her little raised eyebrows, she deemed so certain, it wasn't possible to object. Dayomka didn't object. He just wanted to listen to her, not argue. She turned toward him and leaned forward, and, without stretching out either of her arms, it was as if she was stretching them across the ruins of all the walls in the world. It isn't ours forever, and it is today. Don't listen to them wagging their tongues about whether this'll happen or that'll happen. It's love, that's all. She was so frank with him. It was as if they'd spent a hundred evenings talking, talking, and talking. And if it hadn't been for the orderly with her sunflower seeds, the nurse, 
the two checker players, the patients shuffling along the corridors. She really might have been ready, there and then, in that little corner, at the finest age of their lives, to help him understand what men live by. His light had gnawed at him constantly, even in his sleep, even a second ago, but he had forgotten it now. It was as if it didn't exist. He looked at the open collar of Asiya's dressing gown, and his lips parted a little. What had repelled him so much when his mother did it, now for the first time struck him as innocent before the whole world, unstained, capable of outweighing all the evil on earth. What about you? Asiya half whispered, sympathetically, but ready to burst into laughter. Haven't you ever... You silly. Haven't you ever... A red hot wave struck Dayomka in the ears, the face, and the forehead. It was as if he had been caught stealing. In twenty minutes, this little girl had knocked him clean off all he had held fast to for years. His throat was dry, and he asked her, like a man begging for mercy, What about you? Just as behind her dressing gown, there was nothing but her nightdress, her breasts, and her soul. So behind her words, there was nothing hidden from him. She saw no reason to hide. Oh, me, since the ninth, there was one in our eighth class who got pregnant, and one caught in an apartment. She was, for money, you can't imagine, she had her own savings book. How did it come out? She left it in her exercise book, and a teacher found it. The earlier you start, the more exciting it is. Why wait? It's the atomic age. I'm going to reread that last couple paragraphs just to make sure I understand what was just said. This is so incredibly hard to uh, read because there's like not, there's no, they only, uh, they have all these quotes, like pages of quotes, but they don't say who said what, but for like every 400 words. So it's, okay, so somebody's asking the question, so what about you? Uh, so uh, Asiya half whispered sympathetically. So she's talking right now, ready to burst into laughter. Haven't you ever, period, 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 guessing that means fucked. You silly, haven't you ever? A red hot wave struck Dionka in the ears, the face and the forehead. It was as if he had been caught stealing. In twenty minutes, this little girl had knocked him clean off of all he had held fast to for years. His throat was dry as he asked her, like a man begging for mercy, What about you? Just as behind her dressing gown, there was nothing but her nightdress, her breasts, and her soul. So behind her words, there was nothing hidden from him. She saw no reason to hide. Oh, me! Since the ninth... There was one in our eighth class who got pregnant, and one got caught in an apartment. She was for money. Can you imagine? She had her own savings book. How did it come out? She left it in her exercise book, and a teacher found it. So she said one time she, in a certain, and then she switched topics all of a sudden, talking about this girl who was basically prostituting herself, and then got caught because she wrote down like so much money was made from blowing somebody etc and then they found that in her sports book okay so then she says at the end how to come out that's a rhetorical question asked by Asia. she left it in her exercise book and a teacher found it the earlier you start the more exciting it is why wait so it's a totally separate thought disconnected but at the same time kind of connected and then she says and this is the last sentence of the paragraph. It's the atomic age. So basically she's saying YOLO, you know. And that is the end of chapter 10 of Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, read by Carter Banks.